The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Read by Stephen Alexander Chapter 10 Extract from the Diary of Dr. Watson So far, I have been able to quote from the reports which I have forwarded during these early days to Sherlock Holmes. Now, however, I have arrived at a point in my narrative where I am compelled to abandon this method and to trust once more to my recollections, aided by the diary which I kept at the time. A few extracts from the latter will carry me on to those scenes which are indelibly fixed in every detail upon my memory. I proceed, then, from the morning which followed our abortive chase of the convict and our other strange experiences upon the moor. October 16th. A dull and foggy day with a drizzle of rain. The house is banked in with rolling clouds, which rise now and then to show the dreary curves of the moor with thin silver veins upon the sides of the hills and the distant boulders gleaming where the light strikes upon their wet faces. It is melancholy outside and in. The baronet is in a black reaction after the excitements of the night. I am conscious myself of a weight at my heart, and a feeling of impending danger, ever present, which is the more terrible because I am unable to define it. And have I not cause for such a feeling? consider the long sequence of incidents which have all pointed to some sinister influence which is at work around us. There is the death of the last occupant of the hall, fulfilling so exactly the conditions of the family legend, and there are the repeated reports from peasants of the appearance of a strange creature upon the moor. Twice I have with my own ears heard the sound which resembled the distant baying of a hound. It is incredible, impossible, that it should really be outside the ordinary laws of nature. A spectral hound which leaves material footmarks and fills the air with its howling is surely not to be thought of. Stapleton may fall in with such a superstition, and Mortimer also. But if I have one quality upon earth, it is common sense, and nothing will persuade me to believe in such a thing. To do so would be to descend to the level of these poor peasants, who are not content with a mere fiend dog, but must needs describe him with hell-fire shooting from his mouth and eyes. Holmes would not listen to such fancies, and I am his agent. But facts are facts, and I have twice heard this crying upon the moor. Suppose that there were really some huge hound loose upon it, That would go far to explain everything. But where could such a hound lie concealed? Where did it get its food? Where did it come from? How was it that no one saw it by day? It must be confessed that the natural explanation offers almost as many difficulties as the other. And always, apart from the hound, there was the fact of the human agency in London, the man in the cab, and the letter which warned Sir Henry against the moor. This, at least, was real, but it might have been the work of a protecting friend as easily as an enemy. Where was that friend or enemy now? Had he remained in London, or had he followed us down here? Could he, could he be the stranger whom I had seen upon the tour? It is true that I have had only the one glance at him, and yet there are some things to which I am ready to swear— He is no one whom I have seen down here, and I have now met all the neighbours. The figure was far taller than that of Stapleton, far thinner than that of Franklin. Barrymore it might possibly have been, but we had left him behind us, and I am certain that he could not have followed us. A stranger, then, is still dogging us, just as a stranger had dogged us in London. We have never shaken him off. 
if I could lay my hands upon that man, then at last we might find ourselves at the end of all our difficulties. To this one purpose, I must now devote all my energies. My first impulse was to tell Sir Henry all my plans. My second, and wisest one, is to play my own game and speak as little as possible to anyone. He is silent and distray. His nerves have been strangely shaken by that sound upon the moor. I will say nothing to add to his anxieties, but I will take my own steps to attain my own end. We had a small scene this morning after breakfast. Barrymore asked leave to speak with Sir Henry, and they were closeted in his study some little time. Sitting in the billiard room, I more than once heard the sound of voices raised, and I had a pretty good idea what the point was which was under discussion. After a time, the baronet opened his door and called for me. Barrymore considers that he has a grievance, he said. He thinks that it was unfair on our part to hunt his brother-in-law down when he of his own free will had told us the secret. The butler was standing, very pale but very collected, before us. I may have spoken too warmly, sir, said he, and if I have, I am sure that I beg your pardon. At the same time, I was very much surprised when I heard you two gentlemen come back this morning and learn that you had been chasing Selden. The poor fellow has enough to fight against without my putting more upon his track. If you had told us of your own free will, it would have been a different thing, said the baronet. You only told us, or rather your wife only told us, when it was forced from you and you could not help yourself. I didn't think you would have taken advantage of it, Sir Henry. Indeed, I didn't. The man is a public danger. There are lonely houses scattered over the moor and he is a fellow who would stick at nothing. You only want to get a glimpse of his face to see that. Look at Mr. Stapleton's house, for example, with no one but himself to defend it. There is no safety for anyone until he is under lock and key. He'll break into no house, sir. I give you my solemn word upon that. And he will never trouble anyone in this country again. I assure you, Sir Henry that in a very few days the necessary arrangements will have been made, and he will be on his way to South America. For God's sake, sir, I beg of you not to let the police know that he is still on the moor. They have given up the chase there, and he can lie quiet until the ship is ready for him. You can't tell on him without getting my wife and me into trouble. I beg you, sir, to say nothing to the police. What do you say, Watson? I shrugged my shoulders. If he was safely out of the country, it would relieve the taxpayer of a burden. But how about the chance of his holding someone up before he goes? He would not do anything so mad, sir. We have provided him with all that he can want. To commit a crime would be to show where he was hiding. That is true, said Sir Henry. Well, Barrymore. God bless you, sir, and thank you from my heart. It would have killed my poor wife had he been taken again. I guess we are aiding and abetting a felony, Watson. But after what we have heard, I don't feel as if I could give the man up. So there is an end of it. All right, Barrymore, you can go. With a few broken words of gratitude, the man turned. But he hesitated and then came back. You've been so kind to us, sir, that... I should like to do the best I can for you in return. I know something, Sir Henry, and perhaps I should have said it before, but it was long after the inquest that I found it out. I've never breathed a word about it yet to a mortal man. It's about poor Sir Charles's death. The Baronet and I were both upon our feet. Do you know how he died? No, sir, I don't know that. What then? I know why he was at the gate at that hour. It was to meet a woman. To meet a woman? He? Yes, sir. And the woman's name? I can't give you the name, sir. But I can give you the initials. 
Her initials were LL. How do you know this, Barrymore? Well, Sir Henry, your uncle had a letter that morning. He had usually a great many letters, for he was a public man and well known for his kind heart, so that everyone who was in trouble was glad to turn to him. But that morning, as it chanced, there was only this one letter, so I took the more notice of it. It was from Coombe Tracy, and it was addressed in a woman's hand. Well? Well, sir, I thought no more of the matter, and never would have done, had it not been for my wife. Only a few weeks ago she was cleaning out Sir Charles's study, it had never been touched since his death, and she found the ashes of a burnt letter in the back of the grate. The greater part of it was charred to pieces, but one little slip, the end of a page, hung together, and the writing could still be read, though it was grey on a black ground. It seemed to us to be a postscript at the end of the letter, and it said, Please, please, as you are a gentleman, burn this letter, and be at the gates by ten o'clock. Beneath it were signed the initials L.L., have you got that slip? No, sir, it crumbled all to bits after we moved it. Had Sir Charles received any other letters in the same writing? Well, sir, I took no particular notice of his letters. I should not have noticed this one, only it happened to come alone. And you have no idea who L.L. is? No, sir. No more than you have. But I expect if we could lay our hands upon that lady, we should know more about Sir Charles's death. I cannot understand, Barrymore, how you came to conceal this important information. Well, sir, it was immediately after that that our own trouble came to us. And then again, sir, we were both of us very fond of Sir Charles, as we well might be considering all that he has done for us. To rake this up couldn't help our poor master... And it's well to go carefully when there's a lady in the case. Even the best of us. You thought it might injure his reputation? Well, sir, I thought no good could come of it. But now you have been kind to us, and I feel as if it would be treating you unfairly not to tell you all that I know about the matter. Very good, Barrymore. You can go. When the butler had left us, Sir Henry turned to me. Well, Watson, what do you think of this new light? It seems to leave the darkness rather blacker than before. So I think. But if we can only trace L.L., it should clear up the whole business. We have gained that much. We know that there is someone who has the facts, if we can only find her. What do you think we should do? Let Holmes know all about it at once. It will give him the clue for which he has been seeking. I am much mistaken if it does not bring him down. I went at once to my room and drew up my report of the morning's conversation for Holmes. It was evident to me that he had been very busy of late, for the notes which I had from Baker Street were few and short, with no comments upon the information which I had supplied, and hardly any reference to my mission. No doubt his blackmailing case is absorbing all his faculties. And yet this new factor must surely arrest his attention and renew his interest. I wish that he were here. October 17th All day today the rain poured down, rustling on the ivy and dripping from the eaves. I thought of the convict out upon the bleak, cold, shelterless moor. Poor fellow. Whatever his crimes, he has suffered something to atone for them. And then I thought of that other one, the face in the cab, the figure against the moon. Was he also out in that deluge, the unseen watcher, the man of darkness? In the evening, I put on my waterproof, and I walked far upon the sodden moor full of dark imaginings, the rain beating upon my face and the wind whistling about my ears. God help those who wander into the great mire now, 
for even the firm uplands are becoming a morass. I found the black tor upon which I had seen the solitary watcher, and from its craggy summit I looked out myself across the melancholy downs. Rain squalls drifted across their russet face, and the heavy slate-coloured clouds hung low over the landscape, trailing in grey wreaths down the sides of the fantastic hills. In the distant hollow on the left, half hidden by the mist, the two thin towers of Baskerville Hall rose above the trees. They were the only signs of human life which I could see, save only those prehistoric huts which lay thickly upon the slopes of the hills. Nowhere was there any trace of that lonely man whom I had seen on the same spot two nights before. As I walked back, I was overtaken by Dr. Mortimer driving in his dog cart over a rough moorland track which led from the outlying farmhouse of Falmire. He had been very attentive to us, and hardly a day has passed that he has not called at the hall to see how we were getting on. He insisted upon my climbing into his dog cart, and he gave me a lift homewards. I found him much troubled over the disappearance of his little spaniel. It had wandered onto the moor and had never come back. I gave him such consolation as I might, but I thought of the pony on the Grimpen Mire, and I do not fancy that he will see his little dog again. By the way, Mortimer, said I, as we jolted along the rough road, I suppose there are few people living within driving distance of this whom you do not know. Hardly any, I think. Can you, then, tell me the name of any woman whose initials are L.L.? He thought for a few minutes. No, said he. There are a few gypsies and labouring folk for whom I can't answer, but among the farmers or gentry there is no one whose initials are those. Wait a bit, though, he added after a pause. There is Laura Lyons. Her initials are LL, but she lives in Coombe Tracy. Who is she? I asked. She is Franklin's daughter. What? Old Franklin the Crank? Exactly. She married an artist named Lyons, who came sketching on the moor. He proved to be a blackguard and deserted her. The fault, from what I hear, may not have been entirely on one side. Her father refused to have anything to do with her, because she had married without his consent, and perhaps for one or two other reasons as well. So between the old sinner and the young one, the girl has had a pretty bad time. How does she live? I fancy old Franklin allows her a pittance, but it cannot be more, for his own affairs are considerably involved. Whatever she may have deserved, one could not allow her to go hopelessly to the bad. Her story got about, and several of the people here did something to enable her to earn an honest living. Stapleton did for one, and Sir Charles for another. I gave a trifle myself. It was to set her up in a typewriting business. He wanted to know the object of my inquiries, but I managed to satisfy his curiosity without telling him too much for there is no reason why we should take anyone into our confidence. Tomorrow morning, I shall find my way to Coombe Tracy, and if I can see this Mrs. Laura Lyons of equivocal reputation, a long step will have been made towards clearing one incident in this chain of mysteries. I am certainly developing the wisdom of the serpent, for when Mortimer pressed his questions to an inconvenient extent, I asked him casually to what type Franklin's skull belonged, and so heard nothing but craniology for the rest of our drive. I have not lived with Sherlock Holmes for nothing. I have only one other incident to record upon this tempestuous and melancholy day. This was my conversation with Barrymore just now, which gives me one more strong card which I can play in due time. Mortimer had stayed to dinner, and he and the baronet played écarté afterwards. The butler brought me my coffee into the library, and I took the chance to ask him a few questions. "'Well?' 
said I. Has this precious relation of yours departed, or is he still lurking out yonder? I don't know, sir. I hope to heaven that he has gone, for he has brought nothing but trouble here. I have not heard of him since I left out food for him last, and that was three days ago. Did you see him then? No, sir, but the food was gone when I next went that way. Then he was certainly there. So you would think, sir, unless it was the other man who took it. I sat with my coffee cup halfway to my lips and stared at Barrymore. You know that there is another man, then? Yes, sir. There is another man upon the moor. Have you seen him? No, sir. How do you know of him, then? Selden told me of him, sir, a week ago or more. He's in hiding, too. But he's not a convict, so far as I can make out. I don't like it, Dr. Watson. I tell you straight, sir, that I don't like it. He spoke with a sudden passion of earnestness. Now listen to me, Barrymore. I have no interest in this matter but that of your master. I have come here with no object except to help him. Tell me frankly what it is that you don't like. Barrymore hesitated for a moment, as if he regretted his outburst or found it difficult to express his own feelings in words. It's all these goings on, sir, he cried at last waving his hand toward the rain-lashed window which faced the moor. There's foul play somewhere, and there's black villainy brewing. To that I'll swear. Very glad I should be, sir, to see Sir Henry on his way back to London again. But what is it that alarms you? Look at Sir Charles's death. That was bad enough, for all that the coroner said. Look at the noises on the moor at night. There's not a man would cross it after sundown if he was paid for it. Look at this stranger hiding out yonder and watching and waiting. What's he waiting for? What does it mean? It means no good to anyone of the name of Baskerville. I'm very glad I shall be to be quit of it all on the day that Sir Henry's new servants are ready to take over the hall. But about this stranger, said I, can you tell me anything about him? What did Selden say? Did he find out where he hid or what he was doing? He saw him once or twice, but he is a deep one and gives nothing away. At first he thought that he was the police, but soon he found that he had some lay of his own. A kind of gentleman he was, as far as he could see, but what he was doing he could not make out. And where did he say that he lived? Among the old houses on the hillside, the stone huts where the old folk used to live. But how about his food? Selden found out that he's got a lad who works for him and brings him all he needs. I dare say he goes to Coombe Tracy for what he wants. Very good, Barrymore. We may talk further of this some other time. When the butler had gone, I walked over to the black window and I looked through a blurred pane at the driving clouds and at the tossing outline of the wind-swept trees. It is a wild night indoors, and what must it be in a stone hut upon the moor? What passion of hatred can it be which leads a man to lurk in such a place at such a time? And what deep and earnest purpose can he have which calls for such a trial? There, in that hut upon the moor, seems to lie the very centre of that problem which has vexed me so sorely. I swear that another day shall not have passed before I have done all that man can do to reach the heart of the mystery. Chapter 11 The Man on the Tour The extract from my private diary, which forms the last chapter, has brought my narrative up to the 18th of October, a time when these strange events 
began to move swiftly towards their terrible conclusion. The incidents of the next few days are indelibly graven upon my recollection, and I can tell them without reference to the notes made at the time. I start, then, from the day which succeeded that upon which I had established two facts of great importance, the one that Mrs. Laura Lyons of Coombe Tracy had written to Sir Charles Baskerville and made an appointment with him at the very place and hour that he met his death, the other that the lurking man upon the moor was to be found among the stone huts upon the hillside. With these two facts in my possession, I felt that either my intelligence or my courage must be deficient if I could not throw some further light upon these dark places. I had no opportunity to tell the baronet what I had learned about Mrs. Lyons upon the evening before, for Dr. Mortimer remained with him at cards until it was very late. At breakfast, however, I informed him about my discovery, and asked him whether he would care to accompany me to Coombe Tracy. At first he was very eager to come, but on second thoughts it seemed to both of us that if I went alone, the results might be better. The more formal we made the visit, the less information we might obtain. I left Sir Henry behind, therefore, not without some prickings of conscience, and drove off upon my new quest. When I reached Coombe Tracy, I told Perkins to put up the horses, and I made inquiries for the lady whom I had come to interrogate. I had no difficulty in finding her rooms, which were central and well appointed. A maid showed me in without ceremony, and as I entered the sitting room, a lady, who was sitting before a Remington typewriter, sprang up with a pleasant smile of welcome. Her face fell, however, when she saw that I was a stranger, and she sat down again and asked me the object of my visit. The first impression left by Mrs. Lyons was one of extreme beauty. Her eyes and hair were of the same rich hazel colour, and her cheeks, though considerably freckled, were flushed with the exquisite bloom of the brunette, the dainty pink which lurks at the heart of the sulphur rose. Admiration was, I repeat, the first impression, but the second was criticism. There was something subtly wrong with the face, some coarseness of expression, some hardness perhaps of eye, some looseness of lip which marred its perfect beauty. But these, of course, are afterthoughts. At the moment I was simply conscious that I was in the presence of a very handsome woman, and that she was asking me the reasons for my visit. I had not quite understood until that instant how delicate my mission was. "'I have the pleasure,' said I, "'of knowing your father.' It was a clumsy introduction, and the lady made me feel it. "'There is nothing in common between my father and me,' she said. "'I owe him nothing, and his friends are not mine. "'If it were not for the late Sir Charles Baskerville and some other kind hearts, "'I might have starved for all that my father cared. "'It was about the late Sir Charles Baskerville that I have come here to see you.' The freckles started out on the lady's face. "'What can I tell you about him?' she asked, and her fingers played nervously over the stops of her typewriter. "'You knew him, did you not?' "'I have already said that I owe a great deal to his kindness. If I am able to support myself, it is largely due to the interest which he took in my unhappy situation.' "'Did you correspond with him?' The lady looked quickly up with an angry gleam in her hazel eyes. "'What is the object of these questions?' she asked sharply. "'The object is to avoid a public scandal. "'It is better that I should ask them here "'than that the matter should pass outside our control.' "'She was silent, and her face was very pale. "'At last she looked up with something reckless and defiant in her manner. "'Well, I'll answer.' she said. What are your questions? Did you correspond with Sir Charles? I certainly wrote to him once or twice to acknowledge his delicacy and his generosity. Have you the dates of those letters? No. Have you ever met him? Yes, once or twice, when he came into Coombe Tracy. He was a very retiring man, and he preferred to do good by stealth. 
but if you saw him so seldom and wrote so seldom, how did he know enough about your affairs to be able to help you, as you say that he has done? She met my difficulty with the utmost readiness. There were several gentlemen who knew my sad history and united to help me. One was Mr. Stapleton, a neighbour and intimate friend of Sir Charles. He was exceedingly kind, and it was through him that Sir Charles learnt about my affairs. I knew already that Sir Charles Baskerville had made Stapleton his almoner upon several occasions, so the lady's statement bore the impress of truth upon it. "'Did you ever write to Sir Charles asking him to meet you?' I continued. Mrs. Lyons flushed with anger again. "'Really, sir, this is a very extraordinary question.' "'I am sorry, madam, but I must repeat it.' "'Then I answer, certainly not.' "'Not on the very day of Sir Charles's death?' "'The flush had faded in an instant, "'and a deathly face was before me. "'Her dry lips could not speak the no "'which I saw rather than heard. "'Surely your memory deceives you,' said I. "'I could even quote a passage of your letter. "'It ran, "'Please, please, as you are a gentleman, "'burn this letter.' and be at the gate by ten o'clock. I thought that she had fainted, but she recovered herself by a supreme effort. "'Is there no such thing as a gentleman?' she gasped. "'You do, Sir Charles, an injustice. He did burn the letter. But sometimes a letter may be legible even when burned. You acknowledge now that you wrote it?' "'Yes, I did write it,' she cried, pouring out her soul in a torrent of words. I did write it. Why should I deny it? I have no reason to be ashamed of it. I wished him to help me. I believed that if I had an interview I could gain his help, so I asked him to meet me. But why at such an hour? Because I had only just learned that he was going to London next day and might be away for months. There were reasons why I could not get there earlier. But why a rendezvous in the garden, instead of a visit to the house? Do you think a woman could go alone at that hour to a bachelor's house? Well, what happened when you did get there? I never went. Mrs. Lyons? No, I swear to you on all I hold sacred, I never went. Something intervened to prevent my going. What was that? That is a private matter. I cannot tell it. You acknowledge, then, that you made an appointment with Sir Charles at the very hour and place at which he met his death, but you deny that you kept the appointment? That is the truth. Again and again I cross-questioned her, but I could never get past that point. Mrs. Lyons, said I, as I rose from this long, inconclusive interview. You are taking a very great responsibility and putting yourself in a very false position by not making an absolutely clean breast of all that you know. If I have to call in the aid of the police, you will find how seriously you are compromised. If your position is innocent, why did you in the first instance deny having written to Sir Charles upon that date? because I feared that some false conclusion might be drawn from it, and that I might find myself involved in a scandal. And why were you so pressing that Sir Charles should destroy your letter? If you have read the letter, you will know. I did not say that I had read all the letter. You quoted some of it. I quoted the postscript. The letter had, as I said, been burned, and it was not all legible. I ask you once again why it was that you were so pressing that Sir Charles should destroy this letter which he received on the day of his death. The matter is a very private one. The more reason why you should avoid a public investigation. I will tell you then. If you have heard anything of my unhappy history, you will know that I made a rash marriage and had reason to regret it. I have heard so much. My life has been one incessant persecution from a husband whom I abhor. The law is upon his side, 
and every day I am faced by the possibility that he may force me to live with him. At the time that I wrote this letter to Sir Charles, I had learned that there was a prospect of my regaining my freedom if certain expenses could be met. It meant everything to me. Peace of mind, happiness, self-respect, everything. I knew Sir Charles's generosity, and I thought that if he heard the story from my own lips, he would help me. Then how is it that you did not go? Because I received help in the interval from another source. Why, then, did you not write to Sir Charles and explain this? So I should have done had I not seen his death in the paper next morning. The woman's story hung coherently together, and all my questions were unable to shake it. I could only check it by finding if she had indeed instituted divorce proceedings against her husband at or about the time of the tragedy. It was unlikely that she would dare to say that she had not been to Baskerville Hall, if she really had been, for a trap would be necessary to take her there, and could not have returned to Coombe Tracy until the early hours of the morning. Such an excursion could not be kept secret. The probability was, therefore, that she was telling the truth, or at least a part of the truth. I came away baffled and disheartened. Once again I had reached that dead wall which seemed to be built across every path by which I tried to get at the object of my mission. And yet the more I thought of the lady's face and of her manner, the more I felt that something was being held back from me. Why should she turn so pale? Why should she fight against every admission until it was forced from her? Why should she have been so reticent at the time of the tragedy? Surely the explanation of all this could not be as innocent as she would have me believe. For the moment, I could proceed no farther in that direction, but must turn back to that other clue which was to be sought for among the stone huts upon the moor. And that was a most vague direction. I realised it as I drove back, and noted how hill after hill showed traces of the ancient people. Barrymore's only indication had been that the stranger lived in one of these abandoned huts, and many hundreds of them are scattered through the length and breadth of the moor. But I had my own experience for a guide, since it had shown me the man himself standing upon the summit of the Black Tor. That, then, should be the centre of my search. From there, I should explore every hut upon the moor until I lighted upon the right one. If this man were inside it, I should find out from his own lips at the point of my revolver, if necessary, who he was and why he had dogged us so long. He might slip away from us in the crowd of Regent Street, but it would puzzle him to do so upon the lonely moor. On the other hand, if I should find the hut and its tenant should not be within it, I must remain there, however long the vigil, until he returned. Holmes had missed him in London. It would indeed be a triumph for me if I could run him to earth where my master had failed. Luck had been against us again and again in this inquiry, but now at last it came to my aid, and the messenger of good fortune was none other than Mr. Frankland, who was standing, grey-whiskered and red-faced, outside the gate of his garden, which opened onto the high road along which I travelled. "'Good day, Dr. Watson!' cried he with unwonted good humour. You must really give your horses a rest and come in to have a glass of wine and to congratulate me. My feelings towards him were far from being friendly after what I had heard of his treatment of his daughter, but I was anxious to send Perkins and the wagonette home, and the opportunity was a good one. I alighted and sent a message to Sir Henry that I should walk over in time for dinner. Then I followed Franklin into his dining room. It is a great day for me, sir. One of the red letter days of my life, he cried with many chuckles. I have brought off a double event. I mean to teach them in these paths that law is law, and that there is a man here who does not fear to invoke it. I have established a right of way through the centre of old Middleton's Park. Slap across it, sir within a hundred yards of his own front door. 
What do you think of that? We'll teach these magnates that they cannot ride roughshod over the rights of the commoners. Confound them. And I've closed the wood where the Fernworthy folk used to picnic. These infernal people seem to think that there are no rights of property and that they can swarm where they like with their papers and their bottles. <laughs> both cases decided, Dr. Watson, and both in my favour. I haven't had such a day since I had Sir John Morland for trespass because he shot in his own warren. How on earth did you do that? Look it up in the books, sir. It will repay reading. Franklin v. Morland, Court of Queen's Bench. It cost me two hundred pounds, but I got my verdict. Did it do you any good? None, sir, none. I am proud to say that I had no interest in the matter. I act entirely from a sense of public duty. I have no doubt, for example, that the Fernworthy people will burn me in effigy tonight. I told the police last time they did it that they should stop these disgraceful exhibitions. The county constabulary is in a scandalous state, sir, and it has not afforded me the protection to which I am entitled. The case of Franklin v. Regina will bring the matter before the attention of the public. I told them that they would have occasion to regret their treatment of me, and already my words have come true. How so? I asked. The old man put on a very knowing expression. Because I could tell them what they are dying to know, but nothing would induce me to help the rascals in any way. I had been casting round for some excuse by which I could get away from his gossip, but now I began to wish to hear more of it. I had seen enough of the contrary nature of the old sinner to understand that any strong sign of interest would be the surest way to stop his confidences. Some poaching case, no doubt, said I with an indifferent manner. Ah, ah, my boy, a very much more important matter than that. What about the convict on the moor? I started. You don't mean that you know where he is, said I. I may not know exactly where he is, but I am quite sure that I could help the police to lay their hands on him. Has it never struck you that the way to catch that man was to find out where he got his food and so trace it to him? He certainly seemed to be getting uncomfortably near the truth. No doubt, said I. But how do you know that he is anywhere upon the moor? I know it because I have seen with my own eyes the messenger who takes him his food. My heart sank for Barrymore. It was a serious thing to be in the power of this spiteful old busybody. But his next remark took a weight from my mind. You'll be surprised to hear that his food is taken to him by a child. I see him every day through my telescope upon the roof. He passes along the same path at the same hour. And to whom should he be going except to the convict? Here was luck indeed, and yet I suppressed all appearance of interest. A child. Barrymore had said that our unknown was supplied by a boy. It was on his track, and not upon the convicts, that Franklin had stumbled. If I could get his knowledge, it might save me a long and weary hunt. But incredulity and indifference were evidently my strongest cards. I should say that it was much more likely that it was the son of one of the moorland shepherds taking out his father's dinner. The least appearance of opposition struck fire out of the old autocrat. His eyes looked malignantly at me, and his grey whiskers bristled like those of an angry cat. "'Indeed, sir,' said he, pointing out over the wide-stretching moor. "'Do you see that black tor over yonder? "'Well, do you see the low hill beyond with the thorn-bush upon it? "'It is the stoniest part of the whole moor. "'Is that a place where a shepherd would be likely to take his station? "'Your suggestion, sir, is a most absurd one.' "'I meekly answered that I had spoken without knowing all the facts. "'My submission pleased him and led him to further confidences.' <clears throat> you may be sure, sir, that I have very good grounds before I come to an opinion. I have seen the boy again and again with his bundle. Every day, 
and sometimes twice a day. I have been able. But wait a moment, Dr. Watson. Do my eyes deceive me? Or is there at the present moment something moving upon that hillside? It was several miles off, but I could distinctly see a small dark dot against the dull green and grey. Come, sir, come, cried Franklin, rushing upstairs. You will see with your own eyes and judge for yourself. The telescope, a formidable instrument mounted upon a tripod, stood upon the flat leads of the house. Franklin clapped his eye to it and gave a cry of satisfaction. Quick, Dr. Watson, quick, before he passes over the hill. There he was, sure enough, a small urchin with a little bundle upon his shoulder, toiling slowly up the hill. When he reached the crest, I saw the ragged, uncouth figure outlined for an instant against the cold blue sky. He looked round him with a furtive and stealthy air, as one who dreads pursuit. Then he vanished over the hill. Well, am I right? Certainly there is a boy who seems to have some secret errand. And what the errand is, even a county constable could guess. But not one word shall they have from me. And I bind you to secrecy also, Dr. Watson. Not a word. You understand me? Just as you wish. They have treated me shamefully. Shamefully. When the facts come out in Franklin v. Regina, I venture to think that a thrill of indignation will run through the country. Nothing would induce me to help the police in any way. For all they cared, it might have been me instead of my effigy which these rascals burned at the stake. Surely you're not going. You will help me to empty the decanter in honour of this great occasion. But I resisted all his solicitations and succeeded in dissuading him from his announced intention of walking home with me. I kept the road as long as his eye was on me, and then I struck off across the moor and made for the stony hill over which the boy had disappeared. Everything was working in my favour, and I swore that it should not be through lack of energy or perseverance that I should miss the chance which fortune had thrown in my way. The sun was already sinking when I reached the summit of the hill, and the long slopes beneath me were all golden green on one side and grey shadow on the other. A haze lay low upon the farthest skyline, out of which jutted the fantastic shapes of Belliver and Vixen Tor. Over the wide expanse, there was no sound and no movement. One great grey bird, a gull or curlew, soared aloft in the blue heaven. He and I seemed to be the only living things between the huge arch of the sky and the desert beneath it. The barren scene, the sense of loneliness, and the mystery and urgency of my task all struck a chill into my heart. The boy was nowhere to be seen, but down beneath me, in a cleft of the hills, there was a circle of the old stone huts, and in the middle of them was one which retained sufficient roof to act as a screen against the weather. My heart leaped within me as I saw it. This must be the burrow where the stranger lurked. At last, my foot was on the threshold of his hiding place. His secret was within my grasp. As I approached the hut, walking as warily as Stapleton would do when with poised net he drew near the settled butterfly, I satisfied myself that the place had indeed been used as a habitation. A vague pathway among the boulders led to the dilapidated opening which served as a door. All was silent within. The unknown might be lurking there, or he might be prowling on the moor. My nerves tingled with the sense of adventure. Throwing aside my cigarette, I closed my hand upon the butt of my revolver, and, walking swiftly up to the door, I looked in. 
the place was empty. But there were ample signs that I had not come upon a full scent. This was certainly where the man lived. Some blankets rolled in a waterproof lay upon that very stone slab upon which Neolithic man had once slumbered. The ashes of a fire were heaped in a rude grate. Beside it lay some cooking utensils and a bucket half full of water. A litter of empty tins showed that the place had been occupied for some time, and I saw, as my eyes became accustomed to the checkered light, a pannikin and a half-full bottle of spirits standing in the corner. In the middle of the hut, a flat stone served the purpose of a table, and upon this stood a small cloth bundle, the same, no doubt, which I had seen through the telescope upon the shoulder of the boy. It contained a loaf of bread, a tinned tongue, and two tins of preserved peaches. As I set it down again, after having examined it, my heart leaped to see that beneath it there lay a sheet of paper with writing upon it. I raised it, and this was what I read, roughly scrawled in pencil. Dr. Watson has gone to Coombe Tracy. For a minute I stood there with the paper in my hands, thinking out the meaning of this curt message. It was I, then, and not Sir Henry, who was being dogged by this secret man. He had not followed me himself, but he had set an agent, the boy, perhaps, upon my track, and this was his report. Possibly I had taken no step since I had been upon the moor, which had not been observed and repeated. Always there was this feeling of an unseen force, a fine net drawn round us with infinite skill and delicacy, holding us so lightly that it was only at some supreme moment that one realised that one was indeed entangled in its meshes. If there was one report, there might be others. So I looked round the hut in search of them. There was no trace, however, of anything of the kind, nor could I discover any sign which might indicate the character or intentions of the man who lived in this singular place, save that he must be of Spartan habits and cared little for the comforts of life. When I thought of the heavy rains and looked at the gaping roof, I understood how strong and immutable must be the purpose which had kept him in that inhospitable abode. Was he our malignant enemy? Or was he by chance our guardian angel? I swore that I would not leave the hut until I knew. Outside the sun was sinking low, and the west was blazing with scarlet and gold. Its reflection was shot back in ruddy patches by the distant pools which lay amid the great Grimpen Mire. There were the two towers of Baskerville Hall, and there a distant blur of smoke which marked the village of Grimpen. Between the two, behind the hill, was the house of the Stapletons. All was sweet and mellow and peaceful in the golden evening light, and yet, as I looked at them, my soul shared none of the peace of nature, but quivered at the vagueness and the terror of that interview which every instant was bringing nearer. With tingling nerves, but a fixed purpose, I sat in the dark recess of the hut and waited with sombre patience for the coming of its tenant. And then at last I heard him. Far away came the sharp clink of a boot striking upon a stone. Then another, and yet another, coming nearer and nearer, I shrank back into the darkest corner and cocked the pistol in my pocket, determined not to discover myself until I had an opportunity of seeing something of the stranger. There was a long pause which showed that he had stopped. Then, once more, the footsteps approached and a shadow fell across the opening of the hut. It is a lovely evening, my dear Watson, said a well-known voice. 
I really think that you will be more comfortable outside than in. Hi, this is just a really quick reminder that if you're enjoying the stories on Willow Audiobooks, it would mean the absolute world to me if you'd consider becoming a patron on Patreon. There are three different pledge tiers, all with different perks attached to them. And above all, you'd be helping me to make sure I can keep doing this consistently. So please head on over to patreon.com slash willow audiobooks and check out how you can get involved. Alternatively, I also really appreciate ratings and reviews left on iTunes or wherever you happen to get your podcasts. So if you haven't done that, please do. Thank you so much. Chapter 12 Death on the Moor For a moment or two, I sat breathless, hardly able to believe my ears. Then my senses and my voice came back to me, while a crushing weight of responsibility seemed in an instant to be lifted from my soul. That cold, incisive, ironical voice could belong to but one man in all the world. Holmes! I cried. Holmes! Come out, said he, and please be careful with the revolver. I stooped under the rude lintel, and there he sat upon a stone outside, his grey eyes dancing with amusement as they fell upon my astonished features. He was thin and worn, but clear and alert, his keen face bronzed by the sun and roughened by the wind. In his tweed suit and cloth cap, he looked like any other tourist upon the moor, and he had contrived, with that cat-like love of personal cleanliness which was one of his characteristics, that his chin should be as smooth and his linen as perfect as if he were in Baker Street. "'I never was more glad to see anyone in my life,' said I as I wrung him by the hand. "'Or more astonished, eh? "'Well, I must confess to it. "'The surprise was not all on one side, I assure you. "'I had no idea that you found my occasional retreat, "'still less that you were inside it, "'until I was within twenty paces of the door. "'My footprint, I presume?' No, Watson, I fear that I could not undertake to recognise your footprint amid all the footprints of the world. If you seriously desire to deceive me, you must change your tobacconist, for when I see the stub of a cigarette marked Bradley, Oxford Street, I know that my friend Watson is in the neighbourhood. You will see it there beside the path. You threw it down, no doubt, at that supreme moment when you charged into the empty hut. Exactly. I thought as much, and knowing your admirable tenacity, I was convinced that you were sitting in ambush, a weapon within reach, waiting for the tenant to return. So you actually thought that I was the criminal? I did not know who you were, but I was determined to find out. Excellent, Watson. And how did you localize me? You saw me, perhaps, on the night of the convict hunt, when I was so imprudent as to allow the moon to rise behind me. Yes, I saw you then. And have, no doubt, searched all the huts until you came to this one. No, your boy had been observed, and that gave me a guide where to look. The old gentleman with the telescope, no doubt. I could not make it out when first I saw the light flashing upon the lens. He rose and peeped into the hut. Ah, I see that Cartwright has brought up some supplies. What's this paper? So, you have been to Coombe Tracy, have you? Yes. To see Mrs. Laura Lyons? Exactly. Well done. Our researches have evidently been running on parallel lines, and when we unite our results, I expect we shall have a fairly full knowledge of the case. Well, I am glad from my heart that you are here, for indeed the responsibility and the mystery were both becoming too much for my nerves. 
But how in the name of wonder did you come here? And what have you been doing? I thought that you were in Baker Street, working out that case of blackmailing. That was what I wished you to think. Then you use me, and yet do not trust me, I cried with some bitterness. I think that I have deserved better at your hands, Holmes. My dear fellow, you have been invaluable to me in this, as in many other cases, and I beg that you will forgive me if I have seemed to play a trick upon you. In truth, it was partly for your own sake that I did it, and it was my appreciation of the danger which you ran which led me to come down and examine the matter for myself. Had I been with Sir Henry and you, it is evident that my point of view would have been the same as yours, and my presence would have warned our very formidable opponents to be on their guard. As it is, I have been able to get about as I could not possibly have done had I been living at the hall, and I remain an unknown factor in the business, ready to throw in all my weight at a critical moment. But why keep me in the dark? For you to know could not have helped us, and might possibly have led to my discovery. You would have wished to tell me something, or in your kindness you would have brought me out some comfort or other, and so an unnecessary risk would be run. I brought Cartwright down with me. You remember the little chap at the express office, and he has seen after my simple wants, a loaf of bread and a clean collar. What does a man want more? He has given me an extra pair of eyes upon a very active pair of feet, and both have been invaluable. Then my reports have all been wasted. My voice trembled as I recalled the pains and the pride with which I had composed them. Holmes took a bundle of papers from his pocket. Here are your reports, my dear fellow, and very well thumbed, I assure you. I made excellent arrangements, and they are only delayed one day upon their way. I must compliment you exceedingly upon the zeal and the intelligence which you have shown over an extraordinarily difficult case. I was still rather raw over the deception which had been practised upon me, but the warmth of Holmes's praise drove my anger from my mind. I felt also in my heart that he was right in what he said and that it was really best for our purpose that I should not have known that he was upon the moor. "'That's better,' said he, seeing the shadow rise from my face. "'And now tell me the result of your visit to Mrs. Laura Lyons. "'It was not difficult for me to guess that it was to see her that you had gone, "'for I am already aware that she is the one person in Coombe Tracy "'who might be of service to us in the matter. "'In fact, if you had not gone today, it is exceedingly probable that I should have gone tomorrow. The sun had set, and dusk was settling over the moor. The air had turned chill, and we withdrew into the hut for warmth. There, sitting together in the twilight, I told Holmes of my conversation with the lady. So interested was he that I had to repeat some of it twice before he was satisfied. This is most important, said he, when I had concluded. It fills up a gap which I had been unable to bridge in this most complex affair. You are aware, perhaps, that a close intimacy exists between this lady and the man Stapleton. I did not know of a close intimacy. There can be no doubt about the matter. They meet, they write. There is a complete understanding between them. Now this puts a very powerful weapon into our hands. If I could use it to detach his wife... His wife? I am giving you some information now, in return for all that you have given me. The lady who has passed here as Miss Stapleton is, in reality, his wife. Good heavens, Holmes! Are you sure of what you say? How could he have permitted Sir Henry to fall in love with her? Sir Henry's falling in love could do no harm to anyone except Sir Henry. He took particular care that Sir Henry did not make love to her, as you have yourself observed. I repeat 
that the lady is his wife and not his sister. But why this elaborate deception? Because he foresaw that she would be very much more useful to him in the character of a free woman. All my unspoken instincts, my vague suspicions, suddenly took shape and centered upon the naturalist. In that impassive, colorless man, with his straw hat and his butterfly net, I seemed to see something terrible, a creature of infinite patience and craft, with a smiling face and a murderous heart. It is he, then, who is our enemy? It is he who dogged us in London? So I read the riddle. And the warning? It must have come from her. Exactly. The shape of some monstrous villainy, half seen, half guessed, loomed through the darkness which had girt me for so long. But are you sure of this, Holmes? How do you know that the woman is his wife? Because he so far forgot himself as to tell you a true piece of autobiography upon the occasion when he first met you, and I dare say he has many a time regretted it since. He was once a schoolmaster in the north of England. Now there is no one more easy to trace than a schoolmaster. There are scholastic agencies by which one may identify any man who has been in the profession. A little investigation showed me that a school had come to grief under atrocious circumstances, and that the man who had owned it, the name was different, had disappeared with his wife. The description agreed. When I learned that the missing man was devoted to entomology, the identification was complete. The darkness was rising, but much was still hidden by the shadows. If this woman is in truth his wife, where does Mrs. Laura Lyons come in? I asked. That is one of the points upon which your own researches have shed a light. Your interview with the lady has cleared the situation very much. I did not know about a projected divorce between herself and her husband. In that case, regarding Stapleton as an unmarried man, she counted, no doubt, upon becoming his wife. And when she is undeceived? Why, then we may find the lady of service. It must be our first duty to see her, both of us, tomorrow. Don't you think, Watson, that you are away from your charge rather long? Your place should be at Baskerville Hall. The last red streaks had faded away in the west, and night had settled upon the moor. A few faint stars were gleaming in a violet sky. One last question, Holmes, I said as I rose. Surely there is no need of secrecy between you and me. What is the meaning of it all? What is he after? Holmes's voice sank as he answered. It is murder, Watson. Refined, cold-blooded, deliberate murder. Do not ask me for particulars. My nets are closing upon him, even as his are upon Sir Henry, and with your help he is already almost at my mercy. There is but one danger which can threaten us. It is that he should strike before we are ready to do so. Another day, two at the most, and I have my case complete. But until then, guard your charge as closely as ever a fond mother watched her ailing child. Your mission today has justified itself, and yet I could almost wish that you had not left his side. Hark! A terrible scream, a prolonged yell of horror and anguish, burst out of the silence of the moor. That frightful cry turned the blood to ice in my veins. Oh, my God! I gasped. What is it? What does it mean? Holmes had sprung to his feet, and I saw his dark, athletic outline at the door of the hut, his shoulders stooping, his head thrust forward, his face peering into the darkness. Hush, he whispered. Hush! 
The cry had been loud on account of its vehemence, but it had pealed out from somewhere far off on the shadowy plain. Now it burst upon our ears, nearer, louder, more urgent than before. Where is it? Holmes whispered, and I knew from the thrill of his voice that he, the man of iron, was shaken to the soul. Where is it, Watson? There, I think. I pointed into the darkness. No, there. Again, the agonized cry swept through the silent night, louder and much nearer than ever, and a new sound mingled with it. A deep, muttered rumble, musical and yet menacing, rising and falling like the low, constant murmur of the sea. The hound! cried Holmes. Come, Watson, come! Great heavens, if we are too late! He had started running swiftly over the moor, and I had followed at his heels. But now, from somewhere among the broken ground immediately in front of us, there came one last despairing yell, and then a dull, heavy thud. We halted and listened. Not another sound broke the heavy silence of the windless night. I saw Holmes put his hand to his forehead, like a man distracted. He stamped his feet upon the ground. He has beaten us, Watson. We are too late. No, no, surely not. Fool that I was to hold my hand. And you, Watson, see what comes of abandoning your charge. But by heaven, if the worst has happened, we'll avenge him. Blindly we ran through the gloom, blundering against boulders, forcing our way through gorse bushes, panting up hills and rushing down slopes, heading always in the direction whence those dreadful sounds had come. At every rise Holmes looked eagerly round him, but the shadows were thick upon the moor, and nothing moved upon its dreary face. Can you see anything? Nothing. But hark! What is that? A low moan had fallen upon our ears. There it was again upon our left. On that side, a ridge of rocks ended in a sheer cliff which overlooked a stone-strewn slope. On its jagged face was spread-eagled some dark, irregular object. As we ran towards it, the vague outline hardened into a definite shape. It was a prostrate man, face downwards upon the ground, the head doubled under him at a horrible angle, the shoulders rounded, and the body hunched together as if in the act of throwing a somersault. So grotesque was the attitude that I could not for the instant realise that the moan had been the passing of his soul. Not a whisper, not a rustle rose now from the dark figure over which we stooped. Holmes laid his hand upon him and held it up again with an exclamation of horror. The gleam of the match which he struck shone upon his clotted fingers and upon the ghastly pool which widened slowly from the crushed skull of the victim. And it shone upon something else which turned our hearts sick and faint within us. The body of Sir Henry Baskerville. There was no chance of either of us forgetting that peculiar ruddy tweed suit, the very one which he had worn on the first morning that we had seen him in Baker Street. We caught the one clear glimpse of it, and then the match flickered and went out, even as the hope had gone out of our souls. Holmes groaned, and his face glimmered white through the darkness. The brute! The brute! I cried with clenched hands. Oh, Holmes, I shall never forgive myself for having left him to his fate. I am more to blame than you, Watson. 
in order to have my case well-rounded and complete, I have thrown away the life of my client. It is the greatest blow which has befallen me in my career. But how could I know, how could I know, that he would risk his life alone upon the moor in the face of all my warnings? That we should have heard his screams, my God, those screams, and yet have been unable to save him. Where is this brute of a hound which drove him to his death? It may be lurking among these rocks at this instant. And Stapleton, where is he? He shall answer for this deed. He shall. I will see to that. Uncle and nephew have been murdered. The one frightened to death by the very sight of a beast which he thought to be supernatural. The other driven to his end in his wild flight to escape from it. But now... We have to prove the connection between the man and the beast. Safe from what we heard, we cannot even swear to the existence of the latter, since Sir Henry has evidently died from the fall. But by heavens, cunning as he is, the fellow shall be in my power before another day is past. We stood with bitter hearts on either side of the mangled body, overwhelmed by this sudden and irrevocable disaster which had brought all our long and weary labours to so piteous an end. Then, as the moon rose, we climbed to the top of the rocks over which our poor friend had fallen, and from the summit we gazed out over the shadowy moor, half silver and half gloom. Far away, miles off, in the direction of Grimpen, a single, steady yellow light was shining. It could only come from the lonely abode of the Stapletons. With a bitter curse, I shook my fist at it as I gazed. Why should we not seize him at once? Our case is not complete. The fellow is wary and cunning to the last degree. It is not what we know, but what we can prove. If we make one false move, the villain may escape us yet. What can we do? There will be plenty for us to do tomorrow. Tonight, we can only perform the last offices to our poor friend. Together, we made our way down the precipitous slope and approached the body, black and clear against the silver stones. The agony of those contorted limbs struck me with a spasm of pain and blurred my eyes with tears. We must send for help, Holmes. We cannot carry him all the way to the hall. Oh, good heavens, are you mad? Oh. He had uttered a cry and bent over the body. <laughs> now he was dancing and laughing and wringing my hand. Could this be my stern, self-contained friend? These were hidden fires indeed. <laughs> a beard! A beard! The man has a beard. A beard? It is not the baronet. It is... Why, it is my neighbour, the convict. With feverish haste, we had turned the body over and that dripping beard was pointing up to the cold, clear moon. There could be no doubt about the beetling forehead, the sunken animal eyes. It was indeed the same face which had glared upon me in the light of the candle from over the rock. The face of Selden, the criminal. Then, in an instant, it was all clear to me. I remembered how the baronet had told me that he had handed his old wardrobe to Barrymore. Barrymore had passed it on in order to help Selden in his escape. Boots, shirt, cap. It was all Sir Henry's. The tragedy was still black enough, but this man had at least deserved death by the laws of his country. I told Holmes how the matter stood, my heart bubbling over with thankfulness and joy. 
Then the clothes have been the poor fellow's death, said he. It is clear enough that the hound has been laid on from some article of Sir Henry's, the boot which was abstracted in the hotel in all probability, and so ran this man down. There is one very singular thing, however. How came Selden in the darkness to know that the hound was on his trail? He heard him. To hear a hound upon the moor would not work a hard man like this convict into such a paroxysm of terror that he would risk recapture by screaming wildly for help. By his cries he must have run a long way after he knew the animal was on his track. How did he know? A greater mystery to me is why this hound, presuming that all our conjectures are correct, I presume nothing. Well then, why this hound should be loose tonight? I suppose that it does not always run loose upon the moor. Stapleton would not let it go unless he had reason to think that Sir Henry would be there. My difficulty is the more formidable of the two, for I think that we shall very shortly get an explanation of yours, while mine may remain forever a mystery. The question now is, what shall we do with this poor wretch's body? We cannot leave it here to the foxes and the ravens. I suggest that we put it in one of the huts until we can communicate with the police. Exactly. I have no doubt that you and I could carry it so far. Hello, Watson. What's this? It's the man himself, by all that's wonderful and audacious. Not a word to show your suspicions. Not a word, or my plans crumble to the ground. A figure was approaching us over the moor, and I saw the dull red glow of a cigar. The moon shone upon him, and I could distinguish the dapper shape and jaunty walk of the naturalist. He stopped when he saw us, and then came on again. Why? Dr. Watson, that's not you, is it? You were the last man that I should have expected to see out on the moor at this time of night. But, dear me, what's this? Somebody hurt? Not... Don't tell me that is our friend, Sir Henry. He hurried past me and stooped over the dead man. I heard a sharp intake of his breath, and the cigar fell from his fingers. Who... who's this? he stammered. It is Selden, the man who escaped from Princetown. Stapleton turned a ghastly face upon us, but by a supreme effort he had overcome his amazement and his disappointment. He looked sharply from Holmes to me. Dear me, what a very shocking affair. How did he die? He appears to have broken his neck by falling over these rocks. My friend and I were strolling on the moor when we heard a cry. I heard a cry also. That was what brought me out. I was uneasy about Sir Henry. Why about Sir Henry in particular? I could not help asking. Because I had suggested that he should come over. When he did not come, I was surprised, and I naturally became alarmed for his safety when I heard cries upon the moor. By the way, his eyes darted again from my face to Holmes's. Did you hear anything else besides a cry? No, said Holmes. Did you? No. What do you mean, then? Oh, you know the stories that the peasants tell about a phantom hound and so on. It is said to be heard at night upon the moor. I was wondering if there were any evidence of such a sound tonight. We heard nothing of the kind, said I. And what is your theory of this poor fellow's death? I have no doubt that anxiety and exposure have driven him off his head. He has rushed about the moor in a crazy state and eventually fallen over here and broken his neck. That seems the most reasonable theory, said Stapleton, and he gave a sigh which I took to indicate his relief. What do you think about it, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? My friend bowed his compliments. You are quick at identification, said he. 
We have been expecting you in these parts since Dr. Watson came down. You are in time to see a tragedy. Yes, indeed. I have no doubt that my friend's explanation will cover the facts. I will take an unpleasant remembrance back to London with me tomorrow. Oh, you return tomorrow? That is my intention. I hope your visit has cast some light upon these occurrences which have puzzled us. Holmes shrugged his shoulders. One cannot always have the success for which one hopes. An investigator needs facts, and not legends or rumours. It has not been a satisfactory case. My friend spoke in his frankest and most unconcerned manner. Stapleton still looked hard at him. Then he turned to me. I would suggest carrying this poor fellow to my house, but it would give my sister such a fright that I do not feel justified in doing it. I think that if we put something over his face, he will be safe until morning. And so it was arranged. Resisting Stapleton's offer of hospitality, Holmes and I set off to Baskerville Hall, leaving the naturalist to return alone. Looking back, we saw the figure moving slowly away over the broad moor, and behind him, that one black smudge on the silvered slope which showed where the man was lying who had come so horribly to his end. "'We're at close grips at last,' said Holmes, as we walked together across the moor. "'What a nerve that fellow has! How he pulled himself together in the face of what must have been a paralysing shock when he found that the wrong man had fallen a victim to his plot!' I told you in London, Watson, and I will tell you now again that we have never had a foeman more worthy of our steel. I am sorry that he has seen you. And so was I at first, but there was no getting out of it. What effect do you think it will have upon his plans now that he knows you are here? It may cause him to be more cautious, or it may drive him to desperate measures at once. Like most clever criminals, he may be too confident in his own cleverness and imagine that he has completely deceived us. Why should we not arrest him at once? My dear Watson, you were born to be a man of action. Your instinct is always to do something energetic. But supposing, for argument's sake, that we had him arrested tonight, what on earth the better off should we be for that? We could prove nothing against him. There's the devilish cunning of it. If he were acting through a human agent, we could get some evidence. But if we were to drag this great dog to the light of day, it would not help in putting a rope around the neck of its master. Surely we have a case. Not a shadow of one. Only surmise and conjecture. We should be laughed out of court if we came with such a story and such evidence. There is Sir Charles's death... "'found dead without a mark upon him. "'You and I know that he died of sheer fright, "'and we know also what frightened him. "'But how are we to get twelve stolid jurymen to know it? "'What signs are there of a hound? "'Where are the marks of its fangs? "'Of course, we know that a hound does not bite a dead body, "'and that Sir Charles was dead before ever the brute overtook him. "'But we have to prove all this.' and we are not in a position to do it. Well then, tonight? We are not much better off tonight. Again, there was no direct connection between the hound and the man's death. We never saw the hound. We heard it, but we could not prove that it was running upon this man's trail. There is a complete absence of motive. No, my dear fellow... We must reconcile ourselves to the fact that we have no case at present, and that it is worth our while to run any risk in order to establish one. And how do you propose to do so? I have great hopes of what Mrs. Laura Lyons may do for us when the position of affairs is made clear to her, and I have my own plan as well. Sufficient for tomorrow is the evil thereof, but I hope before the day is past to have the upper hand at last. I could draw nothing further from him, 
and he walked, lost in thought, as far as the Baskerville gates. Are you coming up? Yes, I see no reason for further concealment. But one last word, Watson. Say nothing of the hound to Sir Henry. Let him think that Selden's death was as Stapleton would have us believe. He will have a better nerve for the ordeal which he will have to undergo tomorrow. When he is engaged, if I remember your report aright, to dine with these people. And so am I. Then you must excuse yourself, and he must go alone. That will be easily arranged. And now, if we are too late for dinner, I think that we are both ready for our suppers. To stay updated with Willow Audiobooks, you can follow us on social media. Just search for Willow Audiobooks on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Or you can visit our webpage at stephenalexanderwillis.com forward slash Willow Audiobooks. If you're enjoying this audiobook, why not leave a rating or a review on iTunes or wherever you happen to get your podcasts?